Chapter 1491 Do It By Yourself Hansen looked around him, and he was able to understand why there were no other creatures around. They must have vacated the area in fear of the big purple crab. Watching the big purple crab use its shell to block the king spirit's attack was enough for Hansen to tell how strong it was. While the crab was occupied by the king spirits, Hansen took the time to examine it. Its shell was black and purplish, like obsidian. Its entire body was like that and you couldn't see a single gap or crevice in its form. It was like it had been wholly forged from steel. Its body was a little bigger than an excavator, but it moved frighteningly quickly. It was more akin to a spider than a crab. The six king spirits surrounded the fiend, but they were unable to damage it. They seemed to be at an impasse. Hansen stopped running and watched until the six king spirits ended up getting chased away by the crab, which was a fearless monster. It just let their super geno cores bang against its shell, all the while it suffered no damage. Between the crab and the corpse of the Shell King, there was very little room in the tunnel. Me and Ghost Shadow will keep this guy busy. You go after the human and kill him. One King Spirit shouted, This monster is extremely strong. I'm not sure you two can hold it by yourselves. I'll stay. Let Ghost Claw and the other two deal with the human, another King Spirit said. Okay. The other king spirits agreed, and the six of them split into two equal-numbered teams. One group would remain with the crab, while the other went over the shell to resume their chase of Hans Sr. Hansen rolled his eyes. Instead of running, he simply flapped his wings to meet with the three king spirits that were coming for him. The king spirits were happy about this. The underworld was not their territory. They were worried they might not be able to catch Hansen there, but now it seemed their need to pursue him had ended. He was coming straight to them. This was good. But Hansen did not want to spend time with them exclusively. After he dodged them a few times, he flew right by them and landed on the shell near the crab. The crab saw Hansen and tried to attack him with its pincer. He dodged the pincer, and then the crab saw the three spirits that were directly behind Hans Senator quickly moved to attack them. The scene suddenly became weird. Considering Hansen's reaction and judgment skills, the king spirits were far worse off than he was. He fought the king spirits near the crab so smoothly that it almost looked like he was cooperating with the shelled fiend. In truth, the crab was trying to attack Hansen, too. But with his movement and ability of prediction, he was able to lead the crab into actually attacking the king spirits. The crab was incredibly powerful. Its body was tough and lethally fast. But even after all that time, Hansen had yet to learn what its geno core was. Whatever it was, if the creature used it, it'd undoubtedly be a scary item. The king spirits were feeling the heat of defeat, and they were struggling to understand whether or not the crab was neutral. It attacked them every time, and Hansen was benefiting from each and every move it made. The king spirits didn't want to go back empty-handed. They couldn't report back if they didn't kill Hans Senator furthermore. They couldn't deal with the humiliation of finding themselves being manipulated and toyed with by a human, either. You guys stay here. Don't let him run. Let me use my cauldron to take out the monster. Then, kill the human, said the king spirit with the bronze cauldron. He had noticed they'd be unable to kill Hansen without first removing the crab from the field of play. Okay. A few of the spirits agreed. They split up and blocked all the routes that Hansen might use to escape. The king spirit with the cauldron gripped the item, making it glow with Elysium power. He opened the cauldron, and something green emerged from it. It was headed for the crab. The crab was big, but it was soon covered by that green light. It was then pulled into the bronze cauldron. The king spirit immediately closed the lid of the cauldron, and you could see a flame flicker around the rim. The crab was being refined on the inside. The bronze cauldron began to rattle and shake, prompting the king spirit to try his hardest to calm it down. The crab was raging like mad on the inside, wishing nothing more than to break free. Kill the human, quick. This beast is too strong, and my cauldron cannot hold it for long, the king spirit shouted as he clutched the cauldron tight. The other king spirits did not say anything. They simply folded in on Hans Senator they were angry, and their desire to crush Hansen was high. Hansen saw there were no escape routes, but he wasn't planning on leaving. He could tell the Elysium cauldron was far weaker than the Elysian umbrella. It wouldn't keep the crab down for long. Hansen just had to hold on until the crab got free. Once it was, the spirits would be done for. Hansen's movements and sword skills were firing on all cylinders, but he was still on the losing side. 
He was up against five, after all. Dad, you can do it. Dad, you can do it. Bauer was on Hansen's back. She shouted support as she clung to his neck. Hansen's arm was nicked by a sword, and so he asked, Bauer, your gourd absorbed their mist. Can you use it to grab their weapons? Yes, Bauer said straightforwardly. Hansen glanced at her in surprise, and he almost got hit again. He'd asked the question casually, not expecting Bauer to actually be able to do this. Why don't you use the gourd to take their weapons away, then? Hansen asked as he dodged another weapon. Bauer lowered her head and said, You said you would keep teaching me to do things on my own. I need to grow up and be independent to be useful. Hansen almost coughed up some blood. He always wondered why the gourd only worked sometimes and not all the time. It did work. She just never planned to make use of it. But right now, Hansen couldn't ask Bauer for help. If he did, he'd be going against his own word. I can bleed, but I sure can't afford to embarrass myself. Hansen gritted his teeth, realizing he couldn't ask Bauer for help anymore. Dad, you can do it. Dad, you can do it. Bauer chanted her support for Hansen again, but he wasn't really fond of it. Hurry up. I'm not going to last. A number of green vines were wreathing around the king's spirit that was holding the cauldron. His entire body smoked and trembled as he clutched the cauldron. He was at the end of his rope. Chapter 1492 Gold Pattern Crat The five spirits that were closing in on Han Sin were in a hurry. Under the buffs of the butterfly Gino Corps, Han Sin's speed and power made him just as strong as them. His movement was strange, and when the five of them surrounded him, they felt that their powers were suppressed and unusable. Many times they thought they were going to hit Han Sen, but their strikes would end up being deflected by an attack coming from one of their own. Try as they might, they couldn't hit him. Ping. There was an explosion. The Elysium cauldron blew up, and the king spirit holding it was sent flying away, spewing blood. The big crab leaped after the spirit through the subsiding fires. It snapped one of its pincers closed on the spirit, immediately cutting him in half. It's out. Hansen was so happy. The faces of the five Elysium spirits changed. Before they could react any further, the crab was rushing over to them with a gold word emblazoned across its back. Hansen was shocked. The word written on the dark purple shell was from an ancient language, and it gleamed as if it had been stitched onto the shell with gold. Hansen had studied ancient texts before, so he quickly remembered that the word meant overbearing. Where did that word come from? Is that the crab's genocore? As Hansen pondered its nature, the crab moved forward to attack one of the king spirits. That king spirit had been holding a sword genocore, and with Elysium power, he repeatedly whacked the incoming pincer. Catcha. With his last hit, the king spirit broke his Gino core across the pincer. Blood flew from his mouth right before he fell into the grasp of the crab's pincers. He too was snapped in half. The crab inscribed with the word overbearing really was overbearing. The king spirit's Gino core and his armor had been cut in half easily. It was scary. Hansen didn't dare watch, as it was too frightening for him to see. If the crab could so easily sunder super Gino cores, it had to be a berserk super creature. Hansen grabbed Bauer and ran, but the other king spirits were running too. Shortly after, the crab's kill tally had mounted to four, and only two spirits were still trying to scramble away. But the big crab did not go after those remaining king spirits, it had instead chosen to go after Hans Sr. SH asterisk T. Why are you going for me and not them? Hansen felt depressed. Hansen thought he could pick up a few easy kills, but that idea was now out the window. All he wanted to do at this point was run. The crab was faster than the king spirits were, and with its claws dragging across the rocks, it caught up to Hansen with ease. Hansen realized he had lost the king spirits, but this threat was an even greater trouble. Daddy, you can do it. Bauer continued to support Hans Sr. Hansen wanted to cry as he ran, and he said, You are my good daughter. The human and the crab ran the length of the underworld, and no matter how he tried, Hansen couldn't shake off his tail. He tried using the labyrinthic passages and complex routes to escape the crab. Eventually, Hansen proceeded through a tunnel that was too small for the crab. But that didn't keep him safe for long, for when the crab came through, it brought down the walls to get to him. The few meter walls were torn down as if they were paper. Hansen kept running, but he eventually found himself at a dead end. There was a wall up ahead that was sealing the cave. Hansen gritted his teeth and used Taya to slash. 
He wanted to be like the crab and bring the wall down so he could proceed. With the god Gino Kor's buff, Hansen's sword glowed red. His strike managed to create a cleft in the stone that was a few meters deep. But Hansen was disheartened. His strike hadn't gotten to the other side of the wall, and how thick that wall might have been, he did not know. Hansen stood in front of the wall as the crab behind him bulldozed through stone. The two-meter cave had doubled. As the walls behind him were turned into rubble, the crab was only 20 meters away from him. Hansen clenched his jaw and swung his sword at the same spot he had previously. He managed to go a few meters deeper this time, but he was still striking stone. SH asterisk T. Is this entirely solid? Is there nothing behind this? Hansen was getting frustrated. The big crab was already behind him, and its pincers were swinging wildly around. Their length covered the extent of the tunnel, robbing Hansen of the ability to dodge. It looks like I'll have to just take a chance. There was no turning back right now, and so Hansen summoned a beast soul. The beast soul was like a scaleless snake. Its body was very strange. It was the super beast soul Hansen had received from alien beast. Super alien beast beast soul, Shea shift type. After the alien beast combined with Hansen, Hansen became a white, scaleless snake. He slithered like an eel. The butterfly Gino core was pocketed for the time being, and Hansen used his alien beast form to writhe around the cave until he became paper thin. Then, he moved against the wall and slithered straight past the pincers. Alien Beast had low defense and not much power, but its body could take on a bunch of different shapes. That made it quite useful. Hansen, with Bauer, evaded the pincer. The Alien Beast Beast soul had thinned, squeezing through the minor gap. But the crab was difficult to deal with. The sharp pincers were still taking aim at Hans Senator. He had to change direction, and he missed the chance to escape. The crab moved its pincers and claws and continued to attack Han Senator. He used Alien Beast to become thin and short to dodge it. But this couldn't go on for long, and if he got hit once, he'd undoubtedly die. He had to find a way out of this predicament and escape. Hansen looked at the big crab and decided he'd go under it. The mass of its body had blocked the exit, but there was a minor gap directly below the crab's belly. Unfortunately, the belly was the crab's strongest point and its claws could easily reach there. But still, he went for the gap. The claws responded quickly, blocking his escape from that direction, and he lurched back. Hansen bit down on his teeth and jumped up. He became a thin, paper-like figure that stuck itself to the crab's belly like a sticker. The crab was incredibly smart, though. It brought its own belly down on the ground, trying to crush Hansen and Bao against the floor of the cave. The thin, snake-like body crawled across the crab, and when the crab's belly whacked the ground, Hansen had already brought Bauer to its back. He was on top of where the gold overbearing word had appeared. Chapter 1493 A Cruel Crab The crab swung its claws, but they couldn't reach Hansen and Bauer who were now on its back. After a while, the crab gave up trying to kill Hans Senator instead, it just started to go back the way it had come. The gold word upon its back, overbearing, eventually dissipated as well. Hansen became human again, holding Bauer as he stood on the back of the crab. They weren't sure what to do. The crab ignored his presence there, but who knew what would happen if Hansen decided to leap off? So, Hansen remained there and did not yet dare to jump. The crab waddled its way through the cave systems, but eventually, Hansen realized it was not returning to where the Shell King had been. He had no idea which way it was going. Not long after, Hansen heard a roaring sound in the distance. His face changed when he realized it was the sound of a waterfall. Does the crab want to dive into the water and try to drown us? Hansen frowned. He could breathe underwater, but it was not like he could spend the rest of his days submerged in water. And what's more, he didn't know if Bauer would fare as well as he would. He didn't know if she could breathe underwater or not. An underground river eventually appeared in front of them. The crab jumped into the river and dived below the surface. Hansen and Bauer stayed with it. Fortunately, Hansen was able to breathe underwater, and he was unaffected. He looked over to Bauer and noticed she was entirely fine, as well. She was playing in the water, and it brought him some peace of mind. The underground river was deeper than Hansen believed it to be, though. The giant, gold pattern crab was firmly inside it. It had dived deeper into the stream. The crab seemed to be swimming downstream, too. Hansen held on to Bauer as he looked around. He saw a number of underwater creatures that all fled upon seeing the crab. 
they all made sure to stay out of its way. The crab remained underwater for an hour. Hansen thought that the crab might have forgotten about him and Bauer's presence on its back, and he considered ways in which he might be able to sneak away. But as soon as Hansen left its back, the pincers quickly approached. He hastily used alien beast to dodge the claw and return to its back. It seemed as if the crab was clearly aware that Hansen was still there. The crab remained intent on trying to kill him. Hansen sat on the crab's back and tried to think of a way in which he might escape. Bauer looked happy, swinging her arms against the water's resistance. She always loved water. The crab did not stop traveling. It followed the stream for a few days, and they had no idea how long that river might have been. It seemed endless. But whenever there was a cave, Hansen could see parts of the holy vine wreathing its way across the ceilings. The vine was huge, and it supposedly held up the entire underworld. This vine is much bigger than the one that gave birth to Bauer. I wonder what will reside in the gourd on this holy vine. Will it be another being similar to Bauer? Hansen wondered to himself. Hansen was unable to think of a way to get out of his current situation. He followed the crab through the water for an additional two days. He eventually noticed the waters had become wider and even deeper. It was like they had come to a bottomless ocean. The crab continued swimming through the wider expanse of water, diving deeper and deeper. This place was far deeper than the river, and not long after, they were submerged a few hundred meters deep underwater. Some underwater creatures were moving around. Hansen could see. They were not afraid of the crab like the others. But still, the crab raised its pincers and grabbed a few of the creatures to munch on. Hansen opened his bulwark umbrella for respite from the water. He brought out some food and water of his own that he could share with Bauer. Not long after, Hansen saw some sort of blue light flash in the distance. It looked like a thunderstorm, but without the sound. The crab was heading in the direction of that thunder, but what its aim was, Hansen had no idea. The thunderstorm flickered between dark and bright, and once the crab had gotten closer, Hansen noticed it wasn't a thunderstorm. It was a giant eel that was like a diamond. The eel had some blue lightning coursing around it. It was like a living storm, and it was rather beautiful. That eel can't be the crab's mate, can it? Is it going to ask the eel to eat us off its back? Hansen's face looked ill as he thought about this. Hansen saw the eel and how scary it looked. If the two really were related in some way, Hansen didn't fancy his chances. The fact that he would have to deal with both the crab and the eel dropped his survival rate by a significant margin. Bauer, can you absorb the crab and eel into the gourd? Hansen asked Bauer. If this would work, Hansen wouldn't mind sacrificing his pride by getting Bauer to solve the problem for him. Bauer shook her head and said, They are too strong. The gourd can't do it. Hansen felt depressed. Nothing was working out for him this time. The eel noticed the crab coming closer, and it became alert. It stared at the crab, and its translucent diamond body, which channeled and coursed with lightning, became stronger. The increased volume of lightning was like a warning for the crab not to come any closer. Hansen was very happy seeing this, and he thought to himself, they aren't together after all. That's great. But when Hansen thought some more, his face fell. The crab was provoking the eel. If the eel released lightning and attacked the crab with it, Hansen and Bauer would obviously be caught in the crossfire. The crab's shell was very strong, so it could take a lightning strike just fine. Hansen was afraid the reason the crab had gone there was to get the eel to kill them on its behalf. The crab raised its pincers to provoke the eel, and then the eel went mad. The blue lightning around it rose in volume. Its entire body was consumed by blue lightning, making it look like some sort of thunder dragon. Boom. A bolt of blue lightning was launched from the eel's body, and it covered the entirety of the crab. The crab hadn't dodged, and it simply accepted the blue lightning. It showered itself in it. There were no injuries, and only a number of bubbles rose around the creature. Hansen felt terrible. When the blue lightning rained down, the umbrella took a powerful hit. It already seemed likely to break. The asterisk M in crab. You are mean. But electrifying us won't be that easy. Hansen tightened his jaw and looked around, trying to find a means of escape. Chapter 1494, Fight Between a Fish and a Crab It wasn't easy, suffering that first barrage of lightning. It had damaged the bulwark umbrella, covering it in cracks. The crab, seeing that Hansen was not dead, swung its pincers to provoke the eel more. The eel became even angrier, and it fired an even greater discharge of lightning towards the crab. Hansen prepared himself 
raising himself up from the crab's back. If he tried to weather the next attack, it wouldn't just be the umbrella that would be burned to cinders. Hansen would be, too. Hansen simply took off from the crab's back. The crab whipped around, following Hansen with its pincers to finish him off. But Hansen transformed into the alien beast and became a scaleless white snake in the water. He dodged the crab's pincers. The alien beast's body lent itself well to underwater maneuverability. Its speed in the water was far greater than Han Sen's natural body. Unfortunately, it still wasn't as fast as the crab. Hansen wasn't in a rush to flee just yet, however. He grabbed Bauer and went to the side of the eel. The big crab caught up. Really wanting to kill Han Senator, the eel thought the crab was actually coming after it, though. The lightning appeared once more, headed for the crab again. Hansen kept circling around the eel to stay out of harm's way, but the eel was getting angrier and angrier in its failed attacks against the crab. The lightning it expelled was getting stronger. In the end, the eel became very infuriated. It spat out a ball of thunder that was as bright as a sun. It landed on the crab, prompting the crab's hair to stand on end. The creature's shell was wholly blackened. The crab had been provoking the eel to kill Hansen, but now that the eel had actually wounded the crab, the crab itself lost its temper with the eel. The crab quit chasing Hansen and went for the eel instead. Both of them fought there, beneath the sea. The seawater rolled like mad. Hansen used this opportunity to return to the surface, shoot out of the water, and transform back into a human while airborne. As Hansen hung in the air, he saw major waves kicking up from the depths of the sea. The blue lightning in the water was lighting up their entire surroundings for some distance. Hansen saw some gold light amidst it, too, which was the gold word on the crab's back. Overbearing. The two beasts were fighting like crazy, but Hansen wasn't in a rush to leave. From his airborne position, he watched the two fight. The asterisk M in crab. Don't let me find the opportunity to kill you. Hansen watched them in the air, planning how he might execute a sneak attack to kill the crab whenever the time was right. After a while, Hansen noticed that while the eel was strong, it still couldn't compete with the gold pattern crab. It was at a disadvantage, and the situation was slowly getting worse for it. It is no wonder he provoked the eel. The creature is weaker than the crab itself. Hansen was annoyed. He wanted to find the chance for an easy kill, but more than anything, he really just wanted to see the crab dead. Seeing the cruel crab's face, Hansen realized that even if the eel died, he wouldn't be able to get anything. If Hansen didn't run, though, the crab would only return its attention to Hansen once the battle with the eel was over. Hansen felt as if leaving now would be wasting an opportunity. So, he thought it over in his mind and decided to summon his butterfly Gino Core and draw Taya. When he found his chance, he swung his red sword towards the crab, but the red light did nothing to the creature. The water extinguished some of its power, unfortunately, and the attack did not even leave a light scratch on its back. Hansen didn't give up, though. He used his sword to attack the crab again, whenever he had the chance. He attacked it in a number of different spots, trying to expose a possible weak spot. The results were disappointing, ultimately. No matter which region of its shell Hansen struck, its edges or even its eyes, nothing seemed to deal damage. No way there's no weak spot. If there isn't, this thing could very well be invincible. Hansen frowned and returned to watch it. The crab's pincers left a lot of marks and wounds on the eel, but the eel's body was very tough, almost as if it had been made out of diamond. There was no blood, and it was still able to remain upright in its fight against the crab. The eel was damaged by the crab again. The eel retaliated by suddenly spitting lightning that went through the crab's eye. It pierced directly through its eyeball. Hansen was shocked. He looked at where the lightning hit and saw a diamond-tipped arrow that had been carried by electricity. It looked rather beautiful. The crab, with its eye gouged by the lightning, let out a fierce squeal. Its pincer grabbed the diamond arrow and pulled it out. The pincer had been able to break a king spear at Super Geno Core, but it couldn't cut the arrow. The crab had no choice but to pull it out and just toss it into the sea. The diamond arrow then flew back to the eel's mouth by its own volition. Then, the eel fired the same arrow out again, aiming for the crab's other eye. The crab was visibly afraid of this diamond arrow. It stared at the arrow intently as the weapon flew towards it, then caught the arrow in mid-flight with its pincer. The crab didn't throw it away this time, though. He went to attack the eel with just one pincer, as his other remained occupied with clutching the arrow. The diamond arrow was unable to get free, putting the eel at a disadvantage once more. 
The eel hadn't used the diamond arrow earlier because it hadn't thought the arrow would do anything to the crab. It was very difficult finding an opportunity in which it could strike the creature in its eye. But despite that one strike earlier, nothing seemed to change. Hansen noticed the crab had been blinded in one eye, though. It was bleeding. Strange. The crab should be able to heal rather swiftly. Why has the wound in its eye not healed yet? Is its healing ability simply slow? Or has the arrow stopped that? Hansen wondered. Whatever the reason, Hansen was given a dash of hope. Hansen took a thoughtful breath and dived into the water. He became a white snake before swimming down towards the crab. He watched underwater for a while, then found a chance in which he could land on the crab's back. After landing down on the crab's back, Hansen returned to his human form. He drew Taya and carefully crawled down beside the crab's eye. The crab was fighting the eel, and it hadn't noticed Hansen there. So, he was able to raise his sword. Taya, covered in the god Gino Kor's red light, was plunged deep into the crab's wounded left eye. The wounded eye's defense wasn't very strong. The red light pierced through it, and Taya sank almost entirely into the damaged left eye. The crab was in agony, and it swung its pincers around in a mad bid to get Hans Senator, but already, Hansen had pulled the sword out and retreated to the spot on the creature's back where it was safe, and its claws couldn't get him. The crab's eye was bleeding like mad, and it looked to be in very bad condition. Chapter 1495, Berserk Super Beast Soul The crab was reeling in agony, and the tension in its pincers relaxed as a result. Because of this, the eel was able to recollect its diamond arrow. The eel had been bullied by the crab the whole time, but now it had an opportunity for retaliation. It fired its arrow at its foe without hesitation. The crab, in the pain it was suffering, could do little more than flail its pincers. The arrow found its target, plunging itself neatly into the crab's second eye. Both of its eyes had been rendered blind, and having lost its vision, the crab had to rely on everything it could feel. Hansen used his Dongshin aura to hide his movement, meaning the crab couldn't detect him at all. With Red Taya in his hand, Hansen returned to its other eye and stabbed it to deliver more anguish. The crab, unable to feel its attacker, continued to flail its claws in futile resistance. The eel's arrow was cooperating with Hansen to bring an end to the crab. The crab wished to flee now, but it was too late for that. The next time it was loosed, the eel's thunder arrow pierced directly into the crab's body. It made the crab spew blood from its mouth. Hansen summoned his strength and ran into the crab's other broken eye. He waved tail like mad, trying to bring ruin to the insides of the crab. But the crab's vitality was very good. In the weakest spot Hansen could find, despite using both Taya and the Super Geno Core, he was only able to deal a minor amount of damage. He couldn't inflict fatal wounds. Hansen and the Diamond Arrow were still free to work, though, and they were slowly able to destroy the inside of the crab's body. The eel itself was continuing to fire geysers of lightning. After half a day of this, the big crab stopped moving. Hansan had been slashing nonstop like a madman. He was afraid if the crab's final blow was delivered by the eel, he'd walk away empty-handed. Seeing that the crab was no longer moving, Hansen didn't stop, though. He used the power of Super Spank to deliver a firm hit to its brain. Although he was unable to break the crab's sequence structure, the blow was enough to deal hearty damage to it. And at the same time, the diamond arrow was in the creature's body, controlled telepathically by the eel. It seemed like the eel was eager to slay the crab, too. After a while, Hansen heard an announcement play in his head. Berserk Super Creature Gold Pattern Crab King Killed. Beast Soul Gained. Geno Core Unobtained. Flesh is edible, and you may harvest its life, Geno Essence. Hansen was very happy. This was a very good super creature, and he had actually managed to obtain its beast soul. Even the eel might have been a berserk super creature. In Hansen's delight, he suddenly felt lightning course through the crab. Hansen knew he'd have to get away from its body. The eel looked at Hansen, then used its entire body to grab hold of the lifeless crab and pull it deep down into the sea. Hansen felt it was a great shame that the crab king's body and life geno essence had been claimed by the eel, but he knew he couldn't fight the creature. So, he had no choice but to let it go. Still, he knew he was lucky enough to obtain a berserk super beast soul. Hansen looked into the Sea of Soul, eager to find out what the Crab King's Beast Soul was like. It looks like an armor-type Beast Soul. That'd be great if it was. The defense of a Berserk Super Creature is incredibly strong, and that would mean I wouldn't have to be afraid of Super Creatures and King Spirits anymore. 
Hansen thought to himself, as he looked at the gold patterned Crab King Beast Soul. Berserk Super Beast Soul Gold Pattern Crab King. Arm Shield. Arm Shield? Hansen was surprised. A Shield Beast Soul wasn't incredibly rare, but it wasn't common, either. Hansen used to have a Shield Super Beast Soul, but he ended up trading it for weapons. Arm Shield type Beast Souls were rare. This was the first one he had ever received. He had seen other people make use of them, but he always believed ordinary shields to be better. It's a berserk super beast soul, though. It has to be something special, Hansen thought. Then he summoned the king crab shield. Hansen saw a purple crab appear on his arm, one that was around the size of a plate. Hansen thought it was a mini king crab, but it was the arm shield. It's so small. I can't defend much with this. I wish it was bigger. Hansen frowned. The defensive properties would be too small. It might be able to block swords, but not aoe type attacks. Hansen thought of that, and then he suddenly saw the shield expand. It became something like a grinding wheel. Hansen was so happy. This thing can grow in size? Can it get even bigger? As Hansen thought of this, the shield grew even bigger. But it also got heavier when this happened, which made it difficult for him to carry. Not long after, the Crab King shield became as big as a house. It was too heavy for Hansen to lift, so he set it down on the ground to let it grow. Luckily, the shield's growth limit was not infinite. When it reached the size of the king crab the beast soul belonged to, it stopped growing. With all of Hansen's power, he was unable to pick it up. Why can't I see the gold word overbearing? Hansen wondered, seeing the absence of that golden word. Although the shield looked good, without the word overbearing on the back, it wasn't perfect. Hansen reverted it back to its smallest size, and it looked like an ordinary crab had latched onto his arm. As he examined it, he suddenly saw a swordfish approaching him. The crab had died, and the eel had gone. The creatures that had previously lived here were now on their way back. Thinking Hansen looked like food, they decided to attack him. The swordfish was coming at Hansen like an arrow. He didn't dodge, though. He raised his arm shield and turned it into a grinding wheel before deflecting the swordfish. Let's try out the defense of this armed shield, Hansen was thinking. The swordfish should have been a sacred blood creature. At that high speed, it looked like a javelin coming directly towards the armed shield. Ping. The moment the swordfish hit the armed shield, Hansen imbued the shield with power and it flashed gold. And at that point, the word overbearing appeared. The swordfish's body blew up. Following that hit, dying the water around it red. Sacred blood creature shockfish killed. No beast soul gained. Geno core shattered. Eat the flesh to gain 0 to 10 Geno points randomly. Hansen was frozen. He knew that a sacred blood creature wouldn't be able to break the shield, but he hadn't expected the fish to explode after just hitting it. Chapter 1496, It's That Dollar. Hansen conducted a few tests. When the arm shield absorbed an impact, the gold word overbearing would show up and the inflicted force would be repelled by the spell work of that word. That's scary. The arm shield has a powerful anti-shock conductivity. This is much stronger than any defensive armor. Hansen was satisfied with the arm shield. Its only con was its weight. If it reached a certain size, Hansen would not even be able to move it. Hansen brought Bauer out of the water with him. Then, the two followed the river. They walked all the way to Mast Shelter, and fortunately, they suffered no more trouble in their journey back. Ling Maya seemed to have been fine all along and she was happy to see Hansen return. Moment Queen told Hansen there had been a commotion in the shelter. Someone held a grudge against Ling Mayer, but when trouble arose, Moment Queen was able to sort it out and keep things running. For the time being, there was nothing concerning going on. Hansen hadn't been home in a while, so he went back to the alliance with Bauer. Hansen couldn't wait to see Little Flower again. Little Flower? Did you miss Dad? Hansen picked up Little Flower and kissed his cheek. He still wasn't able to talk. You haven't been back in a long time. It's been so long, Little Flower will have a hard time recognizing you. Ji Yin and complained. That's because I had some business to take care of. I can stay with you and Little Flower now, at least for a while. Hansen made plans to stay in the Alliance for a time. He'd also be able to examine all the fruits of his labor. Good. I need to select a school for Little Flower to attend. The Tang family built a kindergarten. I've heard good things about it. Many demigods choose to send their kids there, so maybe we should go check it out sometime, Ji Yaren said. How old is Little Flower? You're already shipping him off to school? 
Hansen looked at Ji Yin and with mild shock. Education is best started young. We'll only go and take a look at first. If the place checks out, we can send him there in a couple of years, when he's three years old. Ji Yin and thought about it some more, and then went on to say, You and Tang Zhenliu are good friends, aren't you? Maybe you should give him a nudge about this, and the teachers can give a bit more attention and care to little flower. Hansen told her, It's still early. Let's cross this bridge when we come to it. No, we can't get lazy when it comes to little flower. And since you'll now be resting at home, let me conclude some business of my own. When I'm done, we'll take little flower to the school and see if he likes it there. Ji Yin An was speaking with a tone of seriousness. She was beginning to sound obsessive, but he's still so young. Who knows if he'll like it? Hansen wasn't really sure how to respond to her. Human instincts are most accurate when we're children. We should go now. Hansen started to say something, but Ji Yin Ren gave him a painful stare. Hansen quickly changed what he was going to say and told her, Okay, we'll go later. Little Flower's education is important. But Hansen, inside, was thinking, Does my son really need to go to school to learn stuff? It would be good enough if he just went there to make friends. With his fitness, even if he entered the sanctuaries at this age, he could crawl around and kill super creatures. I wonder if Little Flower can access the sanctuary now? Or does the rule of being a normal human, being of the age of 16, still apply? Oh well, maybe it's not necessary just yet. He should enjoy the few short years of his childhood first. He can go there when he's grown up a little. Hansen didn't plan on making Little Flower a fighter like his father was. It was Little Flower's life, and Hansen was happy to let him dictate his own course. Hansen rested at home for about two days and when boredom hit, he decided to return to the sanctuary. He didn't go hunting, though. He went into the Geno Core storage that was in the shelter. Real Blood, Crystal Core, and Bulwark Umbrella were all silver-class Geno Cores. Only coin had yet to be reinforced nine times. Hansen planned on reinforcing it. As he had come to expect, after testing coin, it leapfrogged to first place in the bronze Geno Core storage's ranking. By this point, the spirits and creatures were numb to this happening. Too many powerful Geno cores had appeared, as of late. Coin's appearance, while it may have been surprising, wasn't as shocking as it had been before. But the name Coin shocked humans far more than when Bulwark Umbrella, Real Blood, and Crystal Core appeared. Humans thought those names were Geno cores for spirits or creatures, but Coin was making people think about the enigmatic dollar. Do you think Coin might be dollar? I'm pretty sure it's dollar. You guys are naive to think this. Just because his title is Dollar and his Geno Core is called Coin. My title is Lady's Friend, but I don't have a Geno Core associated with pretty women. Your name is Lady's Friend. You should probably summon an old woman with your Geno Core. Pa. As if you'd ever summon a young, pretty woman. I'm pretty sure it is Dollar's Geno Core. It's a Geno Core that reached first place in the test, and we know Dollar is simply too strong. There is no way this is Dollar. He's strong but he can't be that strong. The humans bickered and argued about this. Many claimed it was dollar, many others claimed it wasn't. It became a hot topic of discussion in the alliance. But no one knew who dollar really was, either. And a human in the bronze Geno core storage had never made it to the top ten before. No one could challenge coin to find out. Some spirits and creatures wanted to challenge coin, of course, but Hansen did not accept any requests. If he couldn't get to silver in a month, only then would he consider a battle. Hansen exited the Geno Core storage. Then, he used Crystal Core as his key for re-entry. He let Crystal Core conduct a test to confirm its ranking. As expected, Crystal Core once again made it to the first place in the silver test. Crystal Core becoming the number one silver Geno Core was not too surprising. Many people expected this would happen. Now they were hoping to see Real Blood, Bulwark Umbrella, and Coin make the leap. They had all jumped to the first rank before. So, people were keen to wonder which one of those would become first and maintain the first rank. Hansen didn't level up his others yet, though. They could wait, as he didn't want to draw any more unnecessary attention. The Geno Core ranking wasn't everything. The strength of a Geno Core was still dependent on the master that wielded it, as Geno Cores and their abilities were just tools to be used. Hansen did not put much stock in the simple rankings, though. Without a proper fight, it wasn't convincing enough. A few days later, Ji Yin and concluded her business. She brought Bauer and Little Flower to the kindergarten on Planet Gunnet. 
Once you were three years old, you could enter the kindergarten proper. Little Flower had a long time to go before then, so for now, he was just visiting. Chapter 1497 Shadow Old Han, how are you doing lately? At the docking station of Planet Gunnet, Tang Zhenliu welcomed Han Sen and Ji Yanran. Then, he took them to visit the kindergarten. I'm doing fine, what with the steady acceleration of strength, money, and handsomeness. I have a son now, too. Nothing else special, really, Hansen said. If I wasn't weaker than you, I'd kill you right now. Tang Jin Liu gave a smile that showed his teeth. How have you been recently? Hansen asked Tang Jin Liu. Me and old Lin are still struggling in the third god sanctuary. There's still a while to go before I max out my super geno points there. At this rate, it might take me another ten years before I'm able to become a demigod. Tang Jin Liu sighed. Then, he went on to say, you're the sort that walks too fast, and no one else is able to keep up. Old Lin is working hard, too, you know. To max out one's super geno points and become a demigod is not something achievable within a mere couple of years. I was just lucky then. Hansen opened his hands. Hansen was being honest, though. It was the succession of fortunate developments that allowed him to become so strong over such a short period of time. Tang Jin Liu and Lin Feng were talented. They just lacked the luck. It stunted their growth, by comparison. Anyway, you really hurt my feelings. Although this is my place, I'm still going to ask that you buy me dinner. Tang Jin Liu sounded a little angry. The whole of Planet Gunnet is yours. I can't find a place to buy you something here. Hansen laughed. I don't care. But each expense will be on you, Tang Jin Liu said, then proceeded to take them to the kindergarten. The entirety of Planet Gunnet was focused around kindergarten schools. In different areas of the place, they even had creatures that were copies of those that could be found in the first god sanctuary. For instance, there were black bugs that looked like those Hansen fought in the first god sanctuary. They looked exactly alike. The shape, speed, strength, and attack pattern were the same as the real thing. They were robots with AI tailored to train the babies and provide them knowledge regarding creatures and such before they entered the sanctuaries. Technology is pretty great these days isn't it? We didn't have things like this before. When I was in school, we only had instructional videos to watch. Now we can have actual fights, I see. Hansen complimented what he was seeing. Tang Jin Liu smiled and said, we had that technology before, but you went to a school that was for anyone. You didn't have the specialized treatment we can provide. Here, now, things are more delicate. These creatures are 99% real and most of the creatures you used to see in the first god's sanctuary can be found here. They are quite expensive to make. But my school was cheaper than your school, Hansen said. One simple year of education on Planet Gunnet cost more than many people would earn throughout their entire lifetime. Haha, <laughs> how else am I going to make money? But the Tang Family School has the best education available, and it employs the greatest technology you can find in the Alliance. Many high-tier alliance members and demigods send their kids to my school, I'll have you know. Tang Jin Liu paused and continued to say, and that's another important point to factor in. The people who come here to study are of the absolute finest tier of the alliance. They're our future. This works as a smaller society that prepares them for a bigger society in the future. Poor kids. Hansen gave a wry smile. There's nothing we can do about that. There's simply too much competition. The Alliance is developing so fast, there aren't many new solar systems left to be discovered. Now, we're just competing with others for the resources currently available. Tang Jin Li went on to say, the conflict between the humans and Shura is only getting worse. I'm afraid there will be another war soon. If we are unable to establish a decidedly dominant species to rule the universe, these fights and skirmishes will never stop. This is the best era and also the worst. I hope our kids can live a better life and not have to suffer and slog through the many battles we have had to endure, Ji Yanran said. If you can live in peace and comfort, who would ever want to fight? But as for our role in the universe and the sanctuaries, holding ground in both is difficult. We have to fight. Tang Jin Liu paused a little before continuing to say, and truthfully, even if humans do control everything, there will be infighting. No matter what generation they are, the need to fight will always arise. And our kindergarten is perfect for giving kids a head start. Old Tang, your sales pitch is not too shabby. Hansen mocked him. Tang Jin Liu laughed and retorted, I can't help it. I need to earn money. 
I have two daughters and a horrid wife. I need a steady paycheck. I remember your smallest daughter is around the same age as Little Flower. Will she be coming here, too? Hansen asked. You're interested in my daughter already? Tang Zhenyu laughed. We are brothers. Look at my Little Flower. You just know he'll be so handsome in the future. If your daughter doesn't work hard, she'll have no chance with him, Hansen said. That is nonsense. Your little flower is the one that should be working harder. My daughter will be a pretty woman, and guys will be queuing around the block and around the galaxy for a chance of making her theirs. Your little flower needs to grab a ticket and get in line. As they spoke, they ended up walking around the entire school. Ji Yin An was satisfied with the equipment on display and the teachers that were employed. Is the principal of the kindergarten still Tang In? Ji Yin asked. Tang Zhenyo answered. My uncle was called back to command an army. The current principal is my grandma. Her name is Tang Yu. Tang Yu? Hansen was shocked. In the Geno battleground, Elysian Moon told Hansen to deliver a message to a person called Tang Yu. Now that Hansen heard her name again, he remembered the request. But with Elysian Moon's subsequent behavior, Hansen believed she had just been pretending. The possibility of her just making up a name was not something he'd put past her. It could have just been a coincidence, so he didn't keep it in mind too much. After visiting the kindergarten, Tang Zhenyo asked them to stay there for two days. After that, they returned to Planet Roka. They had taken their aircraft to Gunnet this time, as it had been a very long time since Ji Yin and went traveling. It was something of a vacation for them. They had been traveling away from Gunnet for half a day, with Ji Yin and driving. Suddenly, something huge appeared and immediately jumped out of slipped pace. The giant shadow covered their entire airship. Chapter 1498 A New Community A big battleship had leaped out of slip space, appearing directly above Hansen's airship. A sure battleship? Hansen and Ji Yinran's faces changed when they saw it. The ship looked strange, and it wasn't similar to any human ship they had seen before. It didn't quite look like a sure ship, either. This area belongs to the Alliance. There is no way a sure ship would appear here. Ji Yin Ran was handling the ship, and she moved it away from a possible attack trajectory. This possibly sure battleship was enormous. Comparing it to Han Sin's ship was like comparing an elephant with an ant. Before Ji Yin An could drive off, the battleship opened up what looked like a tunnel, and then they were pulled inside. After Han Sin's ship was abducted, the battleship went into slip space once again and disappeared. In Han Sin's ship, on screen, there was a signal telling him that they had been boarded. Then, the image of a royal Shura appeared. Demigod Hansen, if I were you, I'd bring your family down to talk. The royal Shura was smiling. Do you think your battleship can trap me here? Hansen said, looking at the royal Shura. Of course not. A star-class battleship cannot trap a demigod. But look outside. There are five demigod elites standing right outside the ship. And they can destroy you immediately. Even if you are fearless against such odds, you must consider the well-being of your family. The royal Shura was sounding as if he had everything sorted out, under control. Hansen looked outside the ship and he saw five humans there, alongside a few royal Shuras. They did indeed look powerful, just like demigods. What shocked Hansen and Ji Yin and the most was that the humans and Shura were standing there together. Even stranger, there was no sign that this was a proper Shura army. This didn't look like a formally sanctioned team. Hansen's power was enough to break a star-class battleship, but with so many demigods there, he wouldn't be able to save his own airship. Hansen could survive in space for a time, but Ji Yin and and Little Flower could not. Who are you people? Hansen asked with a frown. The Shura smiled before answering. Hansen, do not worry. We are not working for the Shura. We are not working for anyone, as a matter of fact. We are an organization that trumpets liberty, and we have requested your presence here to strike a deal. What deal? Hansen was not nervous in any way. As a matter of fact, he was quite interested. Even if their ship was destroyed, Hansen still had his black beetle to use. He wasn't in that much danger. Why don't we sit down and talk, so I can explain things to you? The Royal Shura smiled once more. Hansen and Ji Yin and looked at each other, and then nodded. Hansen responded with an okay. Hansen opened the ship. He and Ji Yin ran, holding Little Flower and Bower, stepped out. The five demigod humans and Shuras approached. I've come to know a lot about you. My name is Naga, and I am the vice leader of the new community. 
The four by my side are also important members. It was the Royal Shura on screen earlier that was now before him. He smiled when he spoke to Han Sr. Hansen and Ji Yin and frowned. They had never heard of the new community before, but apparently it already had five demigods as members. It also seemed to include a mix of humans and Shuras. They should have heard of a powerful organization such as this before. For what reason did you kidnap me and my family? Hansen asked, straightly. Naga told him, it's not how we usually treat guests, but I'd ask you to come to the discussion room. Hansen and Ji Yin and did not reject their offer. They were here now, and where exactly they discussed matters did not make much of a difference. They followed Naga to the discussion room, where only Naga remained with them. The other four demigods did not join, but a lady brought some drinks and was in the room briefly before leaving. We were supposed to see you at your home, but because of the limited power we possess, we had to do this. Naga seemed apologetic. I'm surprised you went to such lengths. It must have been difficult for you. Hansen knew that even if they were not Shura, appearing here and doing what they had was not an easy task to accomplish. Their little kidnapping hadn't simply required a battleship and a few demigods. They must have had influence in the Alliance to be allowed to slip space into where they had appeared. The effort was worth it, since we've been able to meet you. Naga spoke with sincerity. Then what do you want me here for? Hansen asked. Naga looked at him seriously. I want to invite you to the new community and have you become one of us. I don't know anything about this new community. Why would I join? Hansen said. Naga expected him to say this. The new community is an organization in which race does not matter. All the members are composed of different races. There are humans, Shura, and others, too. Our purpose is to keep the universe safe and make sure that every race is treated fairly. Hansen felt as if the new community was more of a religion or a business organization. They had many demigods in different races, though, so it wasn't a normal religion if it was one. Hansen, don't you want to see peace flourish between races? Naga looked at Hans Sr. Hansen coldly responded, I want peace in the universe, but I'm just an average guy. I don't have such far-reaching dreams. Keeping the world safe sounds like it should be your job. Hansen, you only need to support the ideology. How much extra you do for it does not matter. Even if you only do a small bit, it's fine. We are an organization that believes in freedom. If you can help us in small matters when we need it, that would be tremendous, Naga said. What small help? Hansen asked. It is hard for us to say, but every action performed will be for the betterment of others. You will know this. Hansen frowned. It seemed as if Naga wasn't keen on going into detail and any information Hansen wished to extract was proving too difficult to retrieve. Sorry, I am not that thoughtful of others. You've got the wrong man. You can go to the association that protects different races. The members there will probably share the same values as you do, Hansen said. Naga stopped smiling, and with a serious look, he said, Hansen, I hope you can reconsider your stance. Your power is capable of threatening most creatures that exist in the universe. If I can't ensure that your work will be for the betterment of others, I will have to employ force to ensure you do not bring harm, instead. Chapter 1499 Kill Han Sen's eyes were filled with murder, and he threw a punch towards Naga. His powerful fist did not look special at all. But the power he had gathered up in that one thrown fist was enough to sunder an alloy battleship. A fight seemed unavoidable, so Hansen thought he should be the one to get the first punch in. Naga coldly laughed and threw a punch back towards Han Sen, not wanting to retreat. Ping! Both fists collided, and although neither of them had exhausted the full extent of their powers, the shockwave was enough to blow up the alloy wall in the room. Han Sen did not move. Ji Yin and stood behind Han Sen unaffected, clutching. Little flower. Naga's body stumbled backwards a fair bit, which resulted in him tumbling into an alloy wall and bringing it down on himself. Han Sen's demigod name is real. His fitness is like a gemstone demigod. Naga stood up from the metallic debris with blood smeared across his face. The four demigod humans and Shura swiftly approached and surrounded Han Sr. Naga wiped his lips and said, Because you are too strong, if you lose control, it will bring nothing but harm to the universe. It is our responsibility to avoid this by erasing you. Hansen looked at him and laughed coldly. Who are you to judge if I am harmful to the rest of existence? Do you think you're a god? We aren't gods. We are merely those tasked with protecting this world. 
Naga's face hadn't changed at all. The power in his body suddenly exploded. His body began to change, and the beautiful face of a royal Shura was chased away by a horrid replacement. After he used Shura change, Naga stepped forward to Han Sin and said, I will give you one more chance. If you join us and prove the goodness of your heart, we will let you live. This is the biggest joke I have ever heard and seen. I don't need to prove to anyone whether I'm good or bad. Han Sin's eyes raged with fire as they peered back at Naga. But I have decided that for this day, I'll take a trip to the dark side. That is a shame. I guess I will have to proceed with erasing you, Naga said, then threw a punch towards Han Senator with the Shura change, and him being a four-ranked fighter, it was plain to see how tremendously powerful he was. The other four elites unleashed their own power, too. Humans summoned their demigod Geno cores while the Shura employed their Shura change abilities. Their powers were very strong, easily putting them at a sacred blood level of strength. While sacred blood level enemies might have been fierce opposition to others, it was nothing to Han Sr. Hansen opened his ruby wings, covering his body in red light. With that strong red light, Hansen simply used his hands like swords. He threw one at Naga's incoming fist. Naga's fist, and his arm as well, was entirely lopped off. He realized something was wrong before their forces collided, though, and so he was fortunate enough to take a minor step away. If he hadn't, his entire body would have been cut in half. Without pausing, Hansen flapped his wings and teleported four times. For red light sweeps accompanied each move, quickly bringing an end to four of the demigods and Shuras. They hadn't even been given the opportunity to fight. Impossible. How can you possess such power? You have only just become a demigod. Even if you maxed out your super geno points, you could not reach super. Naga held the shoulder that was squirting blood. With wide open eyes, he looked at the bodies and blood all around him. Ji Yinran was still behind Han Sound, covering Little Flower's eyes. She didn't want her baby to see blood so soon in his life. Who is your master? Who asked you to kill me? Hansen looked at Naga directly. No nameless faction could rally so many demigods. It had to be something rather big. Naga laughed, shook his head, and said, If you had entered the new community, you would have been allowed to see who the leader was. From the way you ask, it doesn't seem as if you'd believe me even if I told you. I might not be able to kill you this time, but next time I surely will. You are getting stronger, and that only equals more harm to the universe. I won't allow you to exist much longer. Who said you'd be given another chance? You're dead, Hansen said quietly. Naga was not afraid. His shoulder continued to bleed, and his face was turning pale, but he still managed to raise a smile. You won't kill me. We miscalculated because we were unaware you had achieved the strength of a superclass, so it was our mistake that we did not bring superclasses along with us. Remember, you are not alone. You might be able to survive, but your wife and son won't. I set up a dead man's trigger. If I die, then the ship will self-destruct. Can your wife and son survive in deep space until you find another planet? Naga cackled loudly. So, you can't kill me. Next time, I won't make the same mistake. Even if you're a super class, the new community will destroy you. Are you done yet? It's time to go, Hansen said. He threw a punch at Naga. Naga was unable to resist. He fell back screaming, You can't kill me. Everything I said is true. If you kill me, your wife and son will die, as well. Blurk. Hansen didn't say a word. His hand simply moved to strike Naga's head, and the red light severed it from the neck. The bloodied head rolled away, its eyes full of shock. Naga clearly hadn't expected Hansen to kill him like that. Boom. Naga hadn't been lying. When he died, the self-destruct system activated. The ship was starting to blow up. Hansen's hand flashed as he summoned the Black Beetle. He said, Ji Yanran, you drive. Ji Yanran put Little Flower inside the Black Beetle, but Hansen did not go in just yet. He jumped on top of the beetle and punched upwards, and the red light cleaved a hole through the ceiling. It went up a thousand meters, forming a root outside the ship. Ji Yanran drove the beetle out, just as the Star Class ship blew up with an explosion that was brighter than the sun. Hansen worried the beetle might get damaged, so he summoned his arm shield to block the shockwave. The gold pattern shield was so powerful, and the explosion of the Star Class ship did not hurt it. Unfortunately, they were lost. While they were on the battleship, they had flown into the borderlands. There was no signal, and Hansen had no clue where they were. Chapter 1500 Main Control Room 
Luckily, the beetle had a galactic map of its own. It was better than the ones the Alliance had, and with it, Ji Yin An was able to determine their location. They were in the Barrens, a place the Alliance had named Plato. It wasn't a long journey to return to the bubble of space humans occupied, and with the speed of the beetle, they estimated that the journey would only take half a day. Hansen relaxed. He looked at Ji Yin and as she drove the beetle and asked her, What is the new community? Have you heard about them before? Ji Yin Ren shook her head. No. But if they managed to summon five human demigods, they couldn't be just some faceless, nameless organization. Father must know something about them. We should ask him. The black beetle flew through the barrens with ease. It was a place not occupied by humans, and they saw nothing as they went. Hansen put the beetle on autopilot, and it gave him, G. Yin Ran, Bauer, and Little Flower the opportunity to play together. Their trip was not boring. The beetle had been flying for about an hour, and as Hansen was playing with Little Flower, he suddenly heard a message coming from the AI. Main control room discovered. Should we land? What main control room? Hansen looked at the black beetle's display with shock. To the left of the beetle was a large planet, one that looked to have been created from diamond. The planet was moving fast, faster than the Alliance's greatest ships. Is that a crystallized planet? Hansen was shocked. He looked at the map, but the charts gave no indication of a diamond planet residing where they currently were. That meant the planet did not belong there, and yet for some reason, there it was. That looks like it. Ji Yin An was the captain of a crystallizer research team, so she knew quite a lot about this stuff. Should we land? The Black Beetle's AI repeated the message. Is it dangerous? Hansen asked. The main control room is devoid of life forms. The risk is minimal, the beetle answered. Ji Yin An and Hansen had a discussion about this, as the discovery of new crystallizer relics was a rare opportunity. Since there wasn't supposed to be any risk, though, they decided they should go just in case they could discover new technology. And since the diamond planet was moving so fast, this could be their only chance to explore this place. Hansen commanded the beetle to land. It didn't do it immediately, and it seemed to fire a signal at the planet first. Only after the signal was sent did they begin approaching. A connection to the main control room has been established. We will begin docking procedures now. The beetle flew down towards the planet. The planet opened up as they approached, as if it were one large docking station itself, and the beetle itself went straight inside. Is this really not dangerous? Hansen asked. The beetle answered, The main control room is running automatically. There are no life forces there, provided no rules are violated, the risk is and will remain minimal for you. And what are the rules of the main control room? Hansen asked. The Beatles' monitors displayed a variety of information that had been translated into the language of the Alliance. Hansen was able to see it all. They carefully read the safety rules before they instructed the Beatle to proceed. The entire planet was some sort of big crystal tool. It was far more advanced than anything the Alliance had. Star-class battleships were like toys before something like this. Hansen and Ji Yin and were in shock, sitting in the Beatle as they were brought in to see the entirety of the main control room. There they could see the operations of the tools of the main control room. The rules dictated that they were not allowed to touch them. If they did, they'd suffer punishment. Although Hansen was a demigod, he still remained careful around all the crystallizer things. Crystallizers were once the most advanced civilization, and they had left behind a lot of technology neither the humans nor Shura had yet come to understand. We have reached the lounge. Would you like to enter? The beetle asked as they reached a crystallizer door. Let's go in. Hanston was tired of seeing those tools at work. He wasn't a scientist or engineer, and just watching them bored him. Hanson was very curious to check out a crystallizer lounge, as this was where they'd come to rest and relax. He was keen to find out how they entertained themselves. The beetle opened the door and landed on the ground. Hanson discovered himself in a plaza with a large number of statues, fountains, and benches. These, however, seemed to have been made of crystal. The strangest thing about what they were seeing, though, was that the statues seemed to depict figures that looked an awful lot like humans. Weird. When the crystallizes existed, there weren't any humans around, were there? So why are there statues of humans? Ji Yin Ren stood before the statue, with a look of grand curiosity. Maybe it's because there were creatures that looked like humans in the past, like the Shura, Hansen suggested. They jumped out of the beetle, and Bauer leaped directly onto a bench. 
The bench that seemed to have been made of crystal was actually plush, and Bauer jumped up and down on it like a trampoline. Because it was a lounge, there were no rules for them to follow there. Hansen wasn't worried about Bauer triggering something, so he left her to play while he walked around with Ji Yanran. There were so many things Hansen didn't understand or know about, and anything he didn't, he could ask the beetle. The beetle would scan the item in response to his query and give him the answers he sought. Hansen found it more and more strange. The furniture and decorations looked very human-like. He wondered why the lounge looked the way it did. Maybe the crystallizes looked like humans? Hansen guessed. With this layout, you could be right. If this is true, it would be a most shocking revelation. The Alliance has researched the crystallizers for the longest time, but we have yet to learn what they might have looked like. It is a common belief that the crystallizers had bodies made from crystal. If they actually looked just like humans, that would be amazing. Ji Yin Ran was beginning to sound very excited. The two of them continued looking around as they spoke, but all of a sudden, something snagged Han Sen's attention. On a chair, there was a book that seemed to have been composed of paper. And surprisingly, Han Sen was able to read the text on it. It was in a written language of ancient humans.